Welcome back to the basement for the beginning of our eighth season. Before we get to the movie, I have an important announcement to make. Over the hiatus, our episode, Tough Guys Don't Dance, our most watched episode, has surpassed 100,000 views. Really? That's one-tenth of a million. A kid eating Tide Pods, a video of that would get 100,000 views in an afternoon. (laughs) So it's small potatoes in the internet realm, but I still feel like it's an important milestone, and I'm very proud of it. I am too, and small potatoes... That's that's good, because normally you only get one potato, if you're a man and you're eating. Good point. I thought our viewers would like to know what our top ten most viewed episodes are. Number two is Fritz the Cat, one of our most hated films. Number three, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, the episode that kicked off season four has risen all the way to the third spot, and it's freaking me out. Yes! Number four, Saturday Night Fever, he hits my hair. (laughs) Number five, Mac and Me. Number six, Scanners, Robert. (laughs) <laughs> Number seven, Top Gun. Number eight, Pet Cemetery. No fair. <laughs> Number nine, Starship Troopers. And number ten, it just cracked the top ten this month. All the way from season four, The Holy Mountain. Ah, well, that deserves to be on the top ten. It kicked out Viva Las Vegas. Sorry, Elvis. You got beat up by some weird Chilean guy. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Tonight's movie has been featured on Seen It. I hadn't seen it then, and I still haven't seen it. But that's going to change tonight. I don't know if he's the hero we need or the hero we deserve, but I do know that he's Darkman. Ah, well... Released in 1990, Darkman stars Francis McDormand, Larry Drake, and Liam Neeson's dog! Liam Neeson. There are also cameos by director John Landis and Basement alum Jenny A. Gutter. Oh. (laughs) This is directed by Sam Raimi and based on a short story he wrote that paid homage to the universal horror movies of the 1930s. The score is by Basement alum Danny Elfman. Darkman was a hit, grossing $49 million worldwide against the $16 million budget. It spawned two direct-to-video sequels, Darkman 2, The Return of Durant, and Darkman 3, Die, Darkman, Die. So when did you see this? Did you see it when it first came out? Oh, no. I saw this four or five years ago. Don't know why I watched it. Hmm. Maybe I ran out of Sam Raimi things to watch. A generous viewer sent this DVD to us in our P.O. box, and we're watching it tonight. For your gift tonight, I've given you something that you can amuse yourself with, even in the dark. Ooh. Well, would you look at that? Thumbchucks. Or as you would call them, thumbachuckas. Yes. Control the roll. Look at that. Lights Mm. up. Thumbchuck. (laughs) Chicka-chicka. This is the only weapon that can defeat Darkman. Come closer. (laughs) No. The elastic isn't long enough to hit you. I don't want to get chucked. So bring your crazy face over to the old leather couch and get ready for some action and adventure with Darkman. Don't look at me! There's a warehouse down by the wharfs, and a deal's going down. Him? Tell fuck you. There you go, uh, Mr. Amy, you have your R rating. Uh, <laughs> hey! Oh. Chucks! One gang is led by this man, the other by Robert Durant, cigar enthusiast. Arnie Becker's not gonna save you now, Benny. Or <clears throat> Victor Safunites. <laughs> it's for my LA Law OGs. Get rid of all your weaponry. Yeah, yeah, there's none chucks. They head into the warehouse. I got three things to say to you, Durant. One. Hello. Two. Nice car. And three. Goodbye. And it turns out they do have a gun because the guy with the fake leg, it's a gun leg. Boink. The other gang is defeated and this man is defingered. <laughs> Oh, that's my touching finger. No, that's my nose picking finger. That's my wedding finger. I never planned to get married, but you never know. I'm still young. But crime's not the only thing that happens in this town. There's also science. Poke. Pick. 
Peyton Westlake, a scientist, is in a lab trying to make a nose. He's working on the formula for synthetic skin, but the problem is, is that the cells are unstable. The skin never lasts for longer than 99 minutes. Ugh! At home with his girlfriend, Julie, there's some kissing and fooling around going on. And then they make silhouette love shadow play. <laughs> That's how we have sex in Ireland. Farm shoulder rub and we're done. <laughs> now, I'm gonna steal your nose. <laughs> it's the next morning. The coffee, it's put this telltale ring on this memorandum. Peyton wants her to marry him. Well, I like you and all, but you know, I'm a busy woman. Let me think about this. All right, next time we see each other, we'll decide. She goes to see her boss, Louis Strack. She's found out through the Belisarius memo. He's been bribing the zoning committee. Here it is, the city of the future. You gotta have a little bit of graft to make something this grand happen. If I am a professional real estate developer, I'm probably a career criminal. I still have to do the right thing. Does the name Robert Durant mean anything to you? Bobby D! And I fully believe he'd do anything to get his hands on that document. There's a breakthrough at the lab! Turns out that light is what decomposes the fake flesh. Once it's dark out, it survives. Well, now that we figured it out, we can go on to become... Oh no! It's the bad guys! They're looking for that memo and they know that Peyton is Julie's boyfriend. They start wrecking the place. Smash itty! Smash itty! They find the memo, but they proceed to beat the crap out of Peyton anyway. They dunk his face in acid. Oddly enough, this has nothing to do with him becoming Dark Man. <laughs> <laughs> Marry me? More like scary, he. And finally, they do this. Quack! Boom! Little dippin' bird set off a fire and everything blew up. Peyton's flaming body flies through the air and lands in the lake. Who sees the explosion? Jules. What the hell is going on? <laughs> Have you never seen a Sam Raimi movie before? But what she doesn't know is that Peyton was found and taken to the hospital. They have his barely surviving corpse and they reanimate it somehow. And they, uh, but it's like, oh yeah. You have a 30, 35 year old male. 35 year old? I'm older than that. I've never been blown up by the mob. <laughs> what have I done with my life? A pretty doctor says a bunch of medical gobbledygook about how he can't feel pain. He wakes up, he has some crazy visions like this and this. Sam Raimi, you be trippin'. And escapes out into the night. Oh, the rain! Goes into the alley, finds himself a big coat. Thank you, dead hobo. Shambles through the city looking for Julie. He sees her, but she doesn't recognize him. I just need two dollars for the bus. Oh, well, I guess I better enter the dark man phase of my life. He goes back to his lab, salvages what equipment he can, presumably dumpster dives for the rest, finds an abandoned warehouse, this looks like a good place for the third act climax fight. And rebuilds his skin making lab. He's gonna try to recreate his face. Siri, make me a face, please. There's quadrants, quadrants, extrapolate. Oh, extrapolate the quadrants. The quadrants. <laughs> Weird science. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, also by Danny Elfman. At the City of the Future Ball. When I was 16, my parents threw me a City of the Future Ball. Oh, it was delightful. <laughs> It was like a dream. I have to know whether you've come to a decision regarding the Belisarius Memorandum. The papers were destroyed in the fire. Which, now that I think about it, thanks for bringing that up. It seems very mysterious that that would happen right after our conversation. <laughs> I'll put two and two together in the bathroom. Bye! <laughs> he asks her to dance. And so the seduction begins. Peyton is at the window looking at it all. Why, why is he there? <laughs> How does he know? <laughs> oh, Julie. Wait a minute, there's that guy who killed, caught, that tried to kill me. It's that Bobby Durant guy. Ah, oh, my face isn't working. I need to find somebody else's face. How about all those goons and thugs that hang out with Durant? Where did he get a camera? He's Dark Man. <laughs> That's not good enough. He starts making faces. High five. One of these goons, Eddie, regularly makes cash pickups, so he makes Eddie's face. I'll make it look like the bald guy is ripping off the money. Here's the cash. 
The Here it is, the cash. <laughs> Where's the money? I it didn't make the pickup. I was asleep, boss. Oh, these plane tickets to Rio are damning evidence. Have a nice flight. <laughs> Then she turns around and sees a guy waiting for the bus, and it's the same bald guy. It's okay, lady. Just take the bottle of booze out of your purse and throw it over your shoulder. Everything will be fine. Boogity boogity. Darkity darkity. Peyton gets mad at a cat. Some kind of a freak. Maybe I should be wearing a funny little hat. He does a little dance. You're dancing freak. In a movie full of things I'm not expecting, <laughs> I think this is the thing I expected the least. See the dancing freak. <laughs> Rage. Face is back. Face is back is what he... And his face is finished. He goes and finds Julie at the graveyard, and they are reunited. I need you too, Jules. That's why I'm here. <gasps> Jules. Oh, it's me, Peyton. Oh, I feel like a rag doll. Living in a movie, I'm a hot tramp in daddy's little cutie. <laughs> I am back, aren't I? Just like always. Oh, Julie, oh. <laughs> a big doggy. <laughs> he creates a Durant face. He has been spying on Durant and knows that Durant is going to go to Chinatown to see Hong Fat and get a bunch of money. He's going to go get that money. <laughs> Fire Marshal Bill, let me show you something. <laughs> So he goes and robs a convenience store as Durant. So now he can do voices. I'm not sure how that happened. Robert G. Durant. The cops go to Durant's house and arrest him. And then he goes to Chinatown to make the pickup. Because every single day is Chinese New Year's <laughs> in Chinatown. Four letter word for mine entrance. Everybody knows that's edit. Durant gets let out on bail. He rushes to Chinatown and Durant and Durant cross paths. Are you doink? I'm seeing double. Four crusties. Peyton escapes with the money. He uses his Chinatown money to take Julie to a carnival. <laughs> I had to be that person for a year at a carnival. <laughs> Just a summer, I should say. Can you, can you still do it? <laughs> <laughs> you still got it, folks. Uh, milk bottle ball game is one. <laughs> Amy Vision. <laughs> but the carny doesn't want to give Peyton his pink elephant. He wants that stuffed pink elephant for Julie. It's a symbol of his love, but the carny's mean. Freak rage happens. Dark man comes out. He has a rage in his face. Breaks the fingers, tosses the guy, screams all around. Freak. I'm a freak. <laughs> <laughs> Julie follows him back to his hidey hole, and she sees what he's up to, and she says, oh, no. Peyton, I want to help you. I'm going to put three billboards outside of town. My boyfriend was disfigured by the mob. Why no arrests, Sheriff? Back in Strack's office. I can't see you anymore. I've gone blind. Peyton's alive. And he's my boyfriend. She sees the Belisarius memo on his desk. She knows that he and Durant are in cahoots. Turns out I'm a bad guy. But remember, I build things. Think of it, Julie. Buildings. <laughs> Tall, tall buildings! If you're not going to kill me, I have things to do. <laughs> That's a good line. <laughs> when you retrieved my memorandum, you failed to excise the good doctor. I don't like loose ends, Robert. I also don't like olives. I just never had a taste for them. I don't like Twin Peaks. I know everyone says it's great, but I just, I just don't get it. She goes to find Darkman. Goons! She's captured by Durant. A big firefight ensues. Peyton has all those faces of all those goons, and he starts swapping them and fooling them. He kills them. Ah! I'm not even sure what just happened there. Ah, that. <laughs> I'm gonna blow you up wherever you are, and they blow up each other, and there's blowing up everyone. And Darkman is on a cord attached to the helicopter. Shit, you like a Polaroid picture. He hooks the helicopter hook onto a semi-truck. Semi-truck goes into a tunnel. And Durant and the helicopter are destroyed. Burn in hell! <laughs> <laughs> but what's this? Durant shows up at Strack's office. Strack takes Peyton out to the scaffolding. He says, I love it up here. I know you're not Durant. You're Dark Man. I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill Julie and I'm going to like it. 
because look at all of this property I own. I'm a rich man. I don't care about zoning bribes. Lewis and Dark Man fight. Dark Man finally gets to jump on Strack. He dangles him out over a thing. Strack says, you can't drop me because you're... Dropping me? It's not really an option for you. <laughs> I stand corrected! Dark Man and Julie have an awkward elevator ride. I can't be with you. Not like this. Not until I fix my face. Catch you on the flippity flop. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> he has another face. He puts... I'm everyone. And no one. <laughs> Groovy. Call me... Dark Man. If you're not going to kill me, I have things to do. Dark Man. Sort of a B-movie by design, I think. Yes. Those firefights and those helicopter chases undoubtedly were very expensive, but the rest of the movie looks so cheap. He knew he was making a movie that you catch on cable at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And it ended up being a hit at the box office. Yes. Which... I think because he knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, if he would have spent $50 million on this movie, it would have been a failure. So I've been meaning to watch this movie since it came out. And over the years, I developed a misconception about it. Yeah. I thought that he had the ability to m change his face on its own. Yes, more like he was a, a natural doppelganger as right, opposed to someone right. who put on masks. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that he made masks with computers. Computers. They can do anything. Let's talk a little bit about plausibility. <laughs> now, if you could quantify plausibility, say, from a scale of 1 to 100, I think this movie would be right at zero. Okay, yes, but it's completely implausible, and I think that's by design as well. Yes, Spider-Man had an internal logic to it. Evil Dead 2 had its own internal logic. The problem with this movie is that it doesn't seem to lay out the logic of its universe. Okay. Granted, it's a universe where a guy can survive that type of explosion, or that computers can do anything if you just ask them the right way. Possibly it's the look of the movie isn't cartoonish enough and it's pretty cartoonish. And, well, it's cartoonish when it's cartoonish, but it's kind of like he flips a switch to rage and, you know, flashback and memories. So he really should have, as with Evil Dead 2 before, just made a solid piece of insane architecture instead of a good piece of architecture with insanity shooting out of it. I knew you'd turn this discussion around to the subject of architecture. Oh, yeah. The real shame of this movie is that you know it was written for Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell would have really sold that role better than Liam Neeson. Yeah. As good of an actor as he is. As he famously proved on British television, cannot do comedy. His seriousness seeps through, and it doesn't help that he's gained such gravity since this movie. Sure. What is Raimi going for? He's going for universal horror. Strangeness. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a circus freak of a movie. Yeah. He's going for this melodrama. It has the shot of the woman immediately becoming a widow. I'm sure Douglas Sirk would have loved to have thought of that and been able to pull it off. One of the really fun things about this is we find out that Strax's superpower is not being afraid of heights. Yeah. It's kind of neat. This movie also has a huge MacGuffin, the money. He never does anything with it. He never updates his equipment. Nope. He just steals money. And yeah. seemingly just to piss Durant off? Yeah, which is enough of a reason to lure Durant out almost. Okay, yeah. all right. Here's a question for Dark Man. Why doesn't he hang out in the darkness more? He knows that light is his weakness. Every single time he comes out, it's at a sunny carnival. Hey, Jules, why don't we hang out at nighttime? Let's go to a movie. Let's have sex in the dark. <laughs> These are all possibilities. Wrap it up. I'll take it. And now, seen it. Seen it. We begin seeing it with a couple of DVDs that were sent to us by some generous viewers in our P.O. box, and one of them is Babyface. Seen it. Seen it. This is a version of the movie that was unearthed, and it was uncut by the censors. Even before the Hays Code, they still censored movies. Yeah. And so it's got about five minutes of sex and violence in it that was cut out of the later version. And it was a pristine print because it had only been viewed once. Barbara Sandwick plays this poor woman who reads two lines of Nietzsche and realizes, <laughs> wait a minute, I shouldn't be used by men. I should use men. And so she basically has sex all the way to the top of a corporation, <laughs> destroying men 
everywhere she goes. And you don't actually get to see the sex happen, but man, is it sexy. If you choose to watch this movie, do yourself a favor. Don't watch the opening credits, because there's a cameo in this that will surprise you. <laughs> All right, we have this. Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare. This is actually a film stage production from the Globe Theatre in London. This is an all-male production of Twelfth Night, done as the Shakespeareans did it. So you get to see Mark Rylance, and he is brilliant in it. He should play Stan Laurel at some time, because when he starts freaking out, he basically becomes Stan Laurel in a dress. I think not since Blackadder have we seen Stephen Fry play a learned fool. <laughs> and it's quite a delight. There's a problem with Stephen Fry's performance. He makes Malvolio almost likable. So many bad things happen to Malvolio when he's thrown into prison and then when he realizes that he's just been tricked this entire time, you're like, yeah, Malvolio, you should be really mad. When in a production of Twelfth Night, at that point, you have to be like, ha ha, they got you. Maybe this production wanted Toby Belch to be the villain. Because he kind of is. And he yeah. kind of plays it that way. Alex Cardinal. You guys should do Midnight Cowboy. I just watched it for film class and loved it. Sorry. I had to read the last part of that like Gene Chalet. Seen it. Seen it. 1969 Best Picture winner. Only X-rated movie to win Best Picture. At its core, it's a very sweet movie. Mm -hmm. And it's so sleazy on the outside. We have these two guys who all they want to do is hustle the world. But really, what all they really want is a friend. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Mission Mojo writes, seen it? Battle Royale. Yeah, I've seen it. I have also seen it. And before we talk about Battle Royale, I want to talk about friendship. Yeah? Making friends when you're an adult isn't as easy as it was when you were a kid or a student. Sometimes it's tricky. Sometimes you meet someone and you think, boy, me and this person have similar interests. This might become a friend, a close friend. So what do you do? You invite them to your house, and you watch Battle Royale. And they proceed to drink most of a bottle of whiskey, and uh, he tries to kiss Tona right in front of me. He's not talking about me. <laughs> now, I know this person still lives in town, and... He might if, even still be alive. And if he watches this show and hears this story and feels a little bit of shame, good. But on to Battle Royale. The thing about Battle Royale, which is often forgotten, is that it was actually illegal in the United States. They could not release it. You could only get bootleg copies of it, like our friend had. This is the movie that I wish The Hunger Games was. It's basically the model of The Hunger Games. I know, but it's so much better. One guy just gets a pair of chopsticks as a weapon, and yeah. oh, he's screwed. If another guy gets uh, a pots and pans for a weapon, he does, <laughs> he does pretty good, if I recall correctly. Come step out of the darkness and into the light of our website. Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. You can see all of our episodes there, all seven years of them, Whoa. plus one. And there are PayPal donation buttons you can donate to support this show. One of our donors is Sophie, who says, This donation is from my boyfriend, Steven. He introduced me to your show a couple of months back, and I've been hooked ever since. If you could give him a Mega Force thumb kiss, that would be amazing. Steven? I'd also like to point out that at our website, we have an updated Hall of Fame and updated show notes for Season 7. You can go there, see what we've talked about and seen it, and you can just read and read all day long. To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the contents of our mail crate, you can check out Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. Look at him with the mail. We watch Darkman, and all of our fingers are still intact. Thanks for joining us as we kick off Season 8 here in the basement, and now, watch this. Look at how much fun you're having. Mm -hmm. I've suddenly become like three times cooler. Why am I not single anymore? Go <laughs> hang out at the bar, twirling the chucks. Ladies. <laughs> it's like next to a Mr. Microphone. I don't know what could pick up the ladies better. <laughs>